Let me ask you a question. It might bring a little bit of like tension in the room, especially 2023. So are you ready for a little tension? What are Christians like? What are Christians like? Some of you may be thinking, what's so tenuous about that? Well, if you ask people today what Christians are like, you may get an answer like this. Christians are judgmental, hypocritical, and oppressive. We must admit that many who have claimed to be Christians, have acted in that way in history. Matter of fact, they've acted in that way in the name of Christ. But the kind of Christian that Paul's been presenting in Philippians is so very different. So very different. Paul has told the Philippians how Christians are to live, what Christians are like. He says they are to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Do you remember that? Standing together, side by side, striving of one mind, harmony with one another, at peace with one another. He said that Christians are those who not who don't look only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. You remember that? And all of those instructions are rooted in the ultimate example of what Christianity is all about, Christ himself, right? Who humbly considered the interests of others, our own interests. Who came to this world, and emptied himself, who obeyed the Father unto death on behalf of sinners, and who is now exalted at the right hand of God. That's the basis, the foundation, of all true, genuine Christianity. That's what Paul had told the Philippians. Now, I couldn't help but read this passage we're looking at this morning and think about Uh, something that Doreen, who's a professor, a teacher for for quite some time, 20 plus years, always tells me. And I'm still trying to grow in these things. It doesn't come natural to me because I like to tell people things, right? You guys know that. I, I like talk for a living. Talk too long. I keep yapping. Even now, I'm going on and on and on. I like to tell people things. She'll say, you can't just tell them. You have to show them. You can't just tell them. You have to show them. And I think what we see happening here in the passage that we're in today, yes, we're reading it, it's words, I'm telling you, Paul's telling the Philippian Christians, but in some way he seems to intend to show them what true Christians are like. He intends to not just tell them, but to show them. Show them in the lives of two living models of what genuine Christianity is. These are Timothy and Epaphroditus. He's, you could say this, he's not only telling them what genuine Christians are, he's showing them how a genuine Christian lives. So I'll ask it again. What are Christians like? How do Christians live? Today, I'm going to invite Jeremy Call to come read the passage for us from Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, and we're going to see four distinctives of genuine Christianity. Please, come read. Our passage comes from the New Testament book of Philippians, starting in chapter 2, verse 19 through 30. This is the word of the Lord. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him 
who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself may also come. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice in seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Friends, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We come to you in total dependence. We ask that your spirit would work in us uh, to teach us and show us uh, all that you intend to reveal. In your word today, transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's get an update on where we are, right? Paul is in prison. He's on lockdown. And as we read before, he's not really sure exactly what's going to happen to him. Maybe he's released. Maybe he's put to death. Maybe he stays in prison. We don't know. He's not sure. He seems to indicate that he is assuming that the Lord is going to enable him to continue because that would benefit the Philippians, if you remember that. Of course, you can imagine the kind of relationship we know Paul has with the Philippian church, that the Philippians have a genuine concern for Paul. He's in prison, right? And they're worried about him. They're anxious. What's going on? How is he doing? And they're also, as we understand, concerned about two other characters that we're introduced to today. One's name is Timothy, and the other is Epaphroditus. Timothy was a disciple of Paul. He came to faith through the influence of his grandmother and his mother. And I couldn't help for just a moment to just be reminded of the fact of the kind of influence that my mother, who led me to Jesus, the first person who pointed me to Christ, and my grandmother, who continued to point me to Christ with her life, how influential those two women were in my own walk. And I wonder if that's not the same for you. This is Timothy. He's a disciple of Paul, yes, but he's come to faith through the love and care and instruction of two godly women in his life. And so Timothy is presented to us. They're worried about him. They're also worried about our new friend Epaphroditus, right? He was a man sent by Philippi, uh, to the church at Philippi, to bring financial support and to kind of communicate and get uh, and attend to the to the needs of Paul, who was in Rome. So, what we see taking place here is Paul's continuing his missionary update. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. He's writing them a letter. He's giving them an update. He's saying, "Hey, this is what's going on. This is where I'm at. These are some concerns that that you can be praying for." And he knew that they were concerned about Timothy and they were concerned about their friend Epaphroditus. Paul hopes to send Timothy, he says in verse 19. Right? They want him back. Send Timothy to us, please. And he hopes to do so. But at this point, he's saying, I can't do that. And so he's saying he finds it necessary, however, to send Epaphroditus back. So that's kind of the relational setting of what's going on as we read these words. So we see that in this situation that involved these people, we can't help but notice the transforming power of the gospel that takes place in these two lives. And that's a good thing to remember right now. That when Paul is talking about Timothy and talking about Epaphroditus, he is talking about two servants, two men who have been powerfully transformed by their trust and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And anything that Paul is going to say about Timothy, anything he's going to say about Epaphroditus, 
is going to be, at its root, the result of the transforming power of the gospel. When the gospel takes root in our lives, the gospel bears fruit in our lives. I don't want you to be, to be misunderstood. Uh, I want, don't want you to, be, to misunderstand what the source of all that we're talking about. We talk about the marks of genuine Christianity. I don't want you to be confused about the source of where that comes from. What you're going to see as Paul lays out these four distinctive markers of genuine Christianity is it's all fruit language. This is fruit language. Don't miss the root, though, please. Okay, don't miss the root. The root is the transforming power of the gospel when someone comes to know who Jesus is and trust in Jesus. The Spirit of God indwells them and empowers them, and then these certain characteristics become the fruit that is born out in their life. That is a very important, uh, necessary, preliminary thing to say before we dive in this morning. So we're seeing some fruits. And in these fruits, not every single fruit that there is. When we talk about the four distinctive markers of genuine Christianity that are here this morning, we're not saying this is everything about Christianity. Just want to be clear about that as well. We're saying these are four distinct markers among many that tell the story and answer the question, what is a Christian? How does a Christian live? And so we see this played out. Verse 19, what does Paul say? He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. He goes on in 23 and 24, I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will, will come too. I hope in the Lord, Jesus. I trust in the Lord. There is something very profound that is just uh, saturated in this passage. This passage is soaked in, I should say. Paul's life is centered on Jesus. This is the 30th time, at least, I did a quick count, 30th time where Paul mentions Jesus. It could easily, as we read, just be some phrase that he throws out there, like some super spiritual language that Paul uses every time he writes. Like, you ever hang around those people? Everything's super spiritual, right? It seems cliche. It seems kind of fake, right? You could think that maybe Paul is just engaging in some kind of super spiritual uh, facade language that's consistent with writing epistles. No, that's not what's happening at all. What's happened to Paul is he's come to know Jesus. And that road to Damascus, he, was, he had an encounter with the risen Lord. And what happened was everything about Paul's life changed. Everything. Jesus became everything to Paul. So that when he's making plans and, and having hopes and dreams as it relates to other people and the future and interactions and things that are taking place, he's saying, I hope in the Lord Jesus. I trust in the Lord Jesus. Everything about Paul's life is about the Lord Jesus. I want you to see that. Don't miss that. Don't miss it. Everything is about Jesus. The fabric of his life, his ministry, his relationships. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That was true for Paul. As we read the passage, that's true of Timothy. As we read the passage, that's true of Epaphroditus. And that's true of the Philippian church. Jesus is everything. Jesus is all to them. That is what Christianity is, a genuine Christianity is all about. It's all about Jesus. Genuine Christianity is a Jesus-centered life. Is that you today? 
as the fruit of the gospel, you're placing your faith and hope in Jesus, radically redefined everything about your life. Is your life Jesus-centered, or is it Jesus-segmented? Meaning, Jesus is just a segment. He's just a piece of the pie. Or is Jesus the whole thing? For Paul, he's not just using super spiritual language. Jesus is everything to him. And that's the fabric of what this letter's about. That's what he's given his life to. Is this true? He says, to live is Christ, he said earlier. That's what life is. I've come to know him. I see who he is. He's everything. That's what a genuine Christian is and how a genuine Christian responds in faith. Is that true as you consider the dynamic of your family? As you think about your job, as you think about your finances, your schedule, is it all in the Lord? Is it all in response to Jesus? For these men, in their lives, it was Jesus-centered. It was Jesus-centered. Genuine Christianity is a Jesus-centered life. But not only that, you see, again, the tone of this letter continues to be deeply relational and personal. Deeply relational and personal. Look at the kind of language Paul uses when he describes Timothy and Epaphroditus, and also the Philippian church in many ways. He says of Timothy, for I have no one like him. He knows that they want Timothy to come to Philippi. Can't do that yet. He's too valuable to me right now. There's no one like him in my life. There's a, there's a connection that he has. There's, a, there's an affection and appreciation that he has for his brother in the Lord. He says in verse 22, But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me. Timothy was not Paul's biological son. He was his son in the faith. And the way he describes Timothy is unique. It's special. It shows that connection. It shows love. He says, Timothy has been to me like a son with a father in his service. What powerful, intimate language. He talks of Epaphroditus. He calls him my brother. Because the Christi Christianity he knows is, is that Christians are, they share a family. They have a father. Brothers and sisters in this family. He calls Epaphroditus his brother. My brother. He calls him his fellow worker in the labor. Fellow soldier in the war the spiritual war that's taking place in the world. He is my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. And oh, by the way, Philippians, don't forget who he is in relationship to you. He is your messenger that you sent and your minister to my need. You get the personal language. Mine, yours. You can't miss the overall sense that we've had in this letter of these people that have a deep love and affection for each other. Friends, that's Christianity. That's, that's what a genuine Christian is like. People loving. People loving. Genuine Christianity is Jesus-centered, but it's also people loving. And before we think for one minute that love is just simply this emotion we have toward one another, because we get all confused about what love is. He goes on to show us how 
their love has been displayed, right? True love is not simply emotional. It is ultimately practical. True love has a genuine concern for someone else and then actually does something to, do, uh, to, to, to address a need. There's an action that's always associated with love, not just an emotion. Right? He says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Genuine concern. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Right? And here I think who he's talking about are these people that are involved in the Philippian church that are causing division. Those who claim to be Christians that are really just pushing personal preferences and demands on other people and causing problems in the life of the church. Maybe even being involved in some false teaching of some kind. They seek their own interests. He's already told us that's not Christian. That's not Christ. The true Christian, the genuine Christian, has their eye out to look for what's going on in the lives of other people, have ears that are open to listen and hear, and then look for tangible, practical ways to respond to human need. And then they act. They serve. Genuine Christianity is a people-loving life. And man, what a prophetic word to us in our age where we are absolutely consumed with ourselves. Not just the world out there, but even as the world affects us in the value systems, in the news, and the, in the this and the that of the world that's out there, the media that we take in shapes our worldview and tells us that we are the most important person in the world. That our needs are to be considered above others. That we're always looking out for number one. That we're engaging in behaviors and decisions and emotions that are self-protective rather than self-giving for the sake of someone else. But friends, that's the world. That's not Christianity. And so Christ ultimately is the one who saw our need. and He did something about it. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the Christian, receiving that mercy, being served first by Jesus, now is responding. Remember, root, fruit, responds in kind. And the fabric of the kind of relationships in the body of Christ is one that we look to one another. We, we try to understand what each other's going through. We care for one another. We make ourselves available. We open up our homes. We respond with acts of kindness and generosity when someone else misses their mortgage payment. It's a life that is other-centered and other-serving. That's genuine Christianity. It's Jesus-centered. And it's people-loving. That's what we see on display here in these two models for, that Paul has given to us. But not only that, he goes on, he says, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with the Father, he has served me, served with me in the gospel. Paul's whole life has been fully devoted to serving the priorities of the kingdom and serving his king and advancing the gospel in the world. That's been what Paul's life is all about. And we think, oh, good for Paul. But Timothy caught on. And he started doing the same. He gave his life to serving the advancement of the gospel. Epaphroditus, the same. He, he gave his life to the serving of the advancement of the gospel. These aren't special, unique people. These are just Christians. And they display for us and model for us what life is really all about. Why we're still here for the advancement of the gospel. 
Why this church was planted 10 years ago, put in this community eight years ago. Why you're alive in the family that you live in, the place that you work, right? The neighborhood in which you live is for the advancement of the gospel. Your life is to serve the advancement of the gospel. What a privilege that you've been invited into a partnership that you can live for something so much more than yourself, something that has eternal value and significance, the advancement of the good news, the hope for the world that Jesus saves for sinners like you and me. That's what life is about. Genuine Christians, life is structured to serve the advancement of the gospel. That's what we're told. That's what they've done. Reminds me of some of the reading I did during my sabbatical. These men in England, in the Northampton Association, Baptist Association, missions was basically dead in Baptist churches. And Andrew Fuller, and John Ryland, and John Sutcliffe, and Samuel Pierce came together. They understood why they were alive. They understood that while they were called by Jesus to Northampton, they were called to so much more for the advancement of the gospel around the world. And they gave their lives, and they partnered side by side. And eventually they sent William Carey to India. And yet it took seven years. But we see the gospel that came to India through the ministry of William Carey. There's a partnership in the advancement of the gospel. Look around this room. If you are a follower of Jesus, you belong to this church, you are a partner together in the service of the advancement of the gospel. You're not just individuals that come and partake of some religious good and service on Sunday and happens to be in the same room. You are partners in the advancement of the gospel, just like those pastors in England 200 years ago. I think even closer to home, as Jack Stinziano, Jordan Stinziano's father, a lawyer, but a devout Christian, alongside his close friend, many of you know Roger Burdick, who owns Driver's Village, for 40 years in this community. They have worked side by side. They've, they've been successful in many ways in their careers and in their businesses, but they understood why they were alive and what their relationships were all about. An attorney and a car salesman. They understood that they were brought together by the Spirit for the advancement of the gospel. And as those two brothers age, it's hard for me to not think, who else will look each other in the eye in this community, know who they are, and know why they're alive? Who will stand up and defend and provide and support and give to the ministry of the local church that advances the gospel in central New York in the decades that come. You notice they're not pastors. They're Christians. They're genuine Christians who partner together to serve in the advancement of the gospel. Genuine Christianity. It's a Jesus-centered life. It's a people-loving life. It's a gospel-serving life. Is that you? Doesn't matter what career you have. Doesn't matter where you live. Doesn't matter how much money you got or don't have. Doesn't matter your network, your circle of relationship. Wherever God has you, whatever He's given to you, do you see your life as a faithful stewarding of it all to serve the advancement of the gospel in this community and in the lives of the people that God's placed you with? And do you see one another as partners? Partners 
in this gospel advance. Last one. These three men were willing to die for and risk all for the work of Christ. Willing to risk all for the work of Christ. He talks of Epaphroditus, and what does he say? On his journey, when he was bringing your aid to me, he tells what happened. He nearly died for the work of Christ. Risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He risked everything when he traveled. Funny, I was joking around a little bit, like, you know, we're traveling to Poland to be an encouragement to our brother Ben Layer that we've been supporting for a couple weeks, going to see him. And it's like the kind of conversations we're having are like, did you get more leg room uh, in your, your flight? You know, travel's a little bit different these days. Back then, when they traveled, it was risky to simply say, yeah, I'll take the letter, I'll take the money. That was a risky adventure. There were dangers along the way. Just the simple, ordinary task of bringing the letter, bringing the correspondence, and the gift that was to attend to the needs of Paul was a very risky adventure. That's what Epaphroditus did. I'll do it. I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know why I'm alive. I understand the dangers. I understand all the risks. Sign me up for Jesus. Praise God. He got sick, but God had mercy on him. Amen? God had mercy on him. We praise God for that. His health was restored. But we're praising God all the more for this example, this model. A man who knew Jesus, trusted Jesus, willing to risk everything for Jesus. This whole scenario is a model for us of just what ordinary Christianity is. Willing to risk everything for Jesus. I will never forget the Sudanese family that started attending Catalyst Church in 2008-ish, I'm getting old, 2008-ish. They were, they come from as refugees, I can't remember what nation they came from, uh, but I know where they were originally from. They came from, from, from Sudan. And one time we had them, after church, talking over a drink or over a meal or something, I can't remember some of those details. It was Jacques and Atong, right? I'm not, I'm not so great with the African dialects, but thanks for your patience with me. Jacques Anatong told us her story, and I'll never forget her story as she went on to share that living in the Sudan, which has a lot of uh, Muslim, uh, is, is Islamic, and uh, subscri uh, subscribes to, to the Muslim religion, and she shared that Somehow she heard the gospel. She heard about Jesus and immediately responded in faith. And her family heard that she had become a Christian. And her family heard that she was intending on getting baptized. And as I remember, they threatened her, if you get baptized, we're going to kill you. And you think of the tension in her heart there. But she knew Jesus. And she placed her faith in Jesus. And she courageously was baptized into Christ Jesus. And then she fled for her life. And her family chased her. And by God's mercy, they did not find her. And she made her way here with her family. She lost everything for Jesus. She lost her family. And the song she sang, as simple and sweet as it is, and she sang for us in that service when she shared, I have decided 
to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. She risked everything. And we're worried about our reputation, our image on social media. We're worried about our salaries. We're worried about our jobs. We're worried about being made fun of. In these moments, I see my own weakness. I don't know about you. But genuine Christianity is risk-taking. Willing to lose everything for Jesus. And yet I ask, do you really lose anything at all in comparison to what you gain? Because didn't Jesus promise his disciples, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. It is a real loss in this life. But when compared to what is gained in Christ, Paul's going to talk about that next week, the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Is it really a loss at all? What did Jim Elliot say? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Amen? He is no fool who gains, gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. In the end, what risk is there, really, when we consider the reward of Christ? The genuine Christian knows the answer to that. There's no risk at all. Genuine Christianity is a risk-taking life, but in the end... The reward, Jesus, for eternity together. Amen? Amen. Friends, this is genuine Christianity. Told to us and shown to us in the life of Timothy and Epaphroditus. These are two models. It's Jesus-centered life. It's people loving Gospel-serving, risk-taking. It's not everything that we can say about Christianity. But it is four distinctive markers of what it means to simply be a disciple of Jesus. True Christianity is so much more than a weekly nod and a $5 bill in a basket. True Christianity is so much more than a positive outlook on life. It's so much more than a source of sentimental encouragement for your work week. Man, is it way more than a self-improvement strategy. It's so much more than just a little bit, a segment of your life. It's everything. And the why? It's because when the gospel takes root, the gospel bears fruit. And so I come back again. Do you know Jesus? Has he revealed himself to you on your Damascus road? Has he shown himself? His worth, his value, his love, his hope, his peace, his forgiveness. Has he revealed himself personally to you? Is the Spirit of God drawing you to Him to be reconciled? If that's true, these fruits will be borne out in your life. So see and recognize what genuine Christianity is today. It might be something different than you thought. And rejoice in it. Right? What does Paul say? He says, verse 29, 
receive him in the Lord with all joy. Recognize true Christians when you see them. And rejoice in them. Look around the room. There's genuine Christians right around you. There's a cause to rejoice. Rejoice in them. Receive one another. Rejoice in one another. And he says, honor those who exemplify it. This might be a simple call for each of us to be more encouraging to one another. Right? And think small. Right? We, don't, we always look for something amazing. You know, like, like any kind of gospel progress, any kind of sign or evidence of grace or the Spirit in somebody else's life is an absolute supernatural work of Almighty God. And there, you think about mental health issues today? Pervasive. I wonder if gospel encouragement, where do we see grace in each other's life? I wonder if God would just use encouragement in the church to simply help. I'm not saying, I'm just going to be overly simple here. But man, is there anything more encouraging and wonderful and life-giving than just someone giving you a word of encouragement? This is where I see God at work in your life. See it, recognize it, rejoice in it, honor it, and pursue it. You might be here today super weak. You hear these four models, or these two models and these, these four characteristics, and you're like, man, I am struggling. I am weak. I'm tired. I'm sinning. Often, repeatedly, you might feel this isn't me. My encouragement to you this morning is, first of all, don't believe the lies of the enemy that bases your identity on your performance today. Base your sense of identity on who Christ says you are and understand that he's filled you with the Holy Spirit. His very presence is in you, and it is sufficient to give you the grace, mercy, and strength that you need to be obedient to him. So pray, cry out, ask God, your faithful father, who if their son or daughter asks for bread, he's not going to give them stone. Say, I need your strength. Fill me with the Spirit and enable these fruits to be born out in my life. There's so much hope for those who are weak today. I'm going to tell you, I feel weak today. Part of it is these these Cedarville students had me working 47 hours since Thursday. Just kidding. We had a great time. If you need strength, God wants to give it to you. Amen? Genuine Christianity. It's a Jesus-centered people-loving, gospel-serving, risk-taking life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that the Spirit would strengthen the weak, that that He would give joy to the downtrodden, I pray that Spirit would awaken in us these things. We thank you for Timothy and Epaphroditus, Lord. They're no heroes, but they are examples. And their example is an encouragement to us that ordinary followers of Jesus can live a transformed life. And they show us what it means to be a Christian. Lord, help us to not be judgmental. Help us to not be hypocritical or oppressive. But do help us to be Jesus-centered, to love others, to serve the gospel, and to risk everything because of the hope we have in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Amen.